Welcome to the Minds of E-Commerce podcast, where you learn one key strategy that made leading e-commerce companies grow exponentially. We cut the bullshit and keep the meat. In a 15-minute episode, founders and executives take us through a deep dive of a strategy so you get to learn and grow your online sales. In the last episode, you heard from Ahmed Zidane of Hori Jab, who shared how they've been able to grow using data, customer feedback, and experimentation as a key strategy for their growth. Today on episode five, get ready. Nick Sharma, former director of direct-to-consumer e-commerce at Hintwater and Vayner Media, will share step-by-step an online ad strategy that helped Hintwater become a $100 million business, according to Forbes. I'm your host, Raphael Pollendagel, and I'm the founder of Splitbase, a conversion optimization agency for lifestyle and fashion e-commerce brands. This is Minds of E-commerce. All right, Nick. Well, thank you and welcome to the show. So as you know, this podcast, Minds of E-commerce, um, is all about going deep and really understanding one key strategy that you've used um, in growing an e-commerce business. Um, so our listeners can, you know, uh, learn and then get tons of insight from you. So you've done tons of work at Hint Water. While you were there, um, you know, I read in Bloomberg that the company reached, you know, over $100 million in revenue. Um, so crazy, crazy growth. Um, and, uh, you know, lots in e-commerce and you were very critical in that growth. So I'd love to know what is that one strategy that you want to share with our listeners um, that you think was critical in the growth of that company? Well, I think one thing that, um, so my background before going into e-commerce in the world of D2C was working with uh, publishers who basically made most of their money off of arbitraging, uh, programmatic, and, and native advertising. And so the whole game there is copy, creative, and click-through rate. And once you get somebody to the site, their content's usually sticky enough to the point where um, they, they're good in terms of having a, a user come to the site, go through a few pages on a slideshow, and then making the revenue. And so having that background, I knew what I knew how cheap of clicks I could get that were still quality, like U.S. desktop consumers. And, um, and one thing I realized when I started working on the brand side is just that like brands are paying a lot of money to, to drive clicks over. And, um, and it's just not necessary because you can definitely get clicks for, for, you know, much cheaper. And the biggest difference is, is that most brands go for trying to sell a product right away or selling a product with a discount um, and essentially just putting their offering in front of someone without really giving them full context or a reason or a why to buy their product in the first place. Mm-hmm. And that still happens today. And that's where you see, you know, CMOs and, and brands talk about how Facebook doesn't work anymore. Um, it's usually because their creative sucks and the experience that they're, that they're driving the outbound click to also sucks. Um, there's no reason why, you know, if you're not spending <laughs> $10 million a month on Facebook that you should be complaining about Facebook. Um, and so, so anyways, so one of the things that I did initially was implement this storytelling strategy. So how do we take um, a consumer who's seeing an ad to buy the product and get them invested in why they should buy the product or, or why the company started and and how that's changed other people's lives or the founder's life or um, you know, how do we build that connection and authenticity? And what we ended up finding was that good storytelling, not only increased conversion rate and click through rate, but it drove down acquisition costs. And the best part about it was that the customer actually knew the story of the product at this point. And so when they got the product and they were drinking it, they could relate to it in a different way. Um, But it also, as a byproduct, caused a higher lifetime value for the customer itself. So instead of seeing customers come in and trying the product and maybe sticking around for a couple months, these people were now bought into a relationship with the product or they had their own story of, of why they're consuming the product. And, um, you know, things like that drove higher lifetime value, which allowed us to scale much quicker and, and um, you know, put more dollars into the right strategies. 
That's awesome. Um, and by building that lifetime value, what's happening is that people, they buy into the brand, right? Because it's at that point, it's, they're looking at the story, they're, they're reading it, they're getting engaged and um, there's like an emotional aspect. So it, instead of just being this bottle of water you're buying, now it becomes brand and something that people um, can relate to. Right? Yeah, so the, the whole idea is, is how do you take performance marketing and brand marketing and fuse them together in a very native way for the consumer to understand mm -hmm. and also reciprocate back out. So, you know, I call it performance branding, which is basically building brand equity on the back of your working media dollars while also driving revenue and sales and building that customer base. Um, and, and you start to see brands doing it now, uh, but there's still a lot that still just don't completely understand it. So smart. Um, so let's say we look at um, the implementation of this, right? So here, um, the concept is that we're implementing a story that's in relation to a product to dr drive more click-throughs and higher conversions to the website and, you know, build a brand on top of that. Now, how does it look like in, in, the, like in real world, right? Um, from the ad to the website, walk us through, yeah, what does it look like? So... Ideally, you're going through your feed and you see an article that pops up. Um, it's an article that catches your attention. There's good copy. There's good creative. Um, you know, on the back end, we're probably testing about 200 different variations of that one piece of creative um, or that ad unit. And you click it. You get to a site. It's a very, very clean UX. That's pretty much where most of the magic sauce comes in is how clean the UX is. Mm -hmm. um, and also just the way the story is written. So... It's a very different way that a story is written for direct response purposes than it's written for editorial purposes. And so, um, so it's the way the story is written, the, the user experience of the site itself. And then from there, it goes straight to a landing page because you've done the, you've given the context and you've educated the consumer on why they need to be consuming this product or, or how, how this product can apply to their life. And they go straight from the article to a landing page and they convert. Got it. So when they see the ad, does the ad is the ad advertised by an influencer, by an external brand, or by or by the brand itself that is selling the product? Yeah. So we we've had success trying multiple different ways to do it. So uh, you can use an influencer, whether that's a homegrown like like an executive at the company, or you can use the brand. Uh, the other thing that um, I've done in the past is. You know, I just have a lot of relationships with people who are influencers and because Facebook is such an underutilized channel for influencers, they all have a page and they're all verified, but they just don't necessarily push content out through Facebook. And so the only way for them to really drum up engagement and reach and impressions and more, more likes is by, you know, letting someone like me use their page to run ads. So so even when you're scrolling through on your Facebook feed or your Instagram feed, you might see a post come through with an article, but it's going to be shared by a person. So it's not really going to look like an ad, but it's still an ad and it, it indicates that it's a sponsored post, but it's just a more native way to show up in the feed, right? Like you wouldn't, you would rather click on, on, on a piece of content shared by another person than you would shared by a brand. Got it. It totally makes sense that I'm guessing, especially if you're seeing an influencer promoting this on Facebook, like you're saying, we're not used to seeing sponsored posts on Facebook by a person. It's always yeah. a brand, right? So it makes it probably even more contextual and yeah. relevant to, you know, when people are browsing on Facebook. Right. And the, and the great thing too, on the influencer side is, is they're also becoming introduced to a completely new audience hmm. uh, a lot of times. So, so you know, we, we don't necessarily need that influencer to fit the audience we're going after. Um, from a creative standpoint, if, it, if we're having an influencer create content for us, as long as they can properly speak to the camera and get the message across, communicate with the person sitting on the other side of the screen, it's usually great, good enough. Um, and then from leveraging the pages perspective, you know, as long as they have a good page and they're not, you know, pushing out content that's against the brand values, um, you're usually in, in a good position to run that for ads. Amazing. And that ad itself, usually is it a video? Is it like a summary to an article that gets people to click, a mix of both? What works best usually? And I'm sure, you know, this is going to change and evolve as, as, as we go on. But Yeah, I could probably be wrong by the time this podcast gets released. <laughs> but um, 
um, you know, for articles, it's just standard link image ad. Um, but there's a lot of testing that goes into it. I mean, we in the past have tested, you know, campaigns with uh, five or ten thousand dollars, and and you know, two to four hundred pieces of variations of that one ad. Right. Um, between copy, images, headlines, ad text, call to action buttons, the pages it's getting shared from, um, you know, all those things play a big role. Yeah, totally. And, so and then there's also different winning ads between different demographics. So you might have older females who, who skew to convert on one, you know, version of creative versus males who are younger might skew to convert on a different version of that creative. Yeah, totally. Super, super important to dive into the granular data and not just at, like the averages, right? Which, you know, some people do. I'm guessing, you know, most people listening to this podcast have businesses above a million dollars, so they know, but um, just a, a reminder. So, okay, perfect. So now you've got the ads. Um, now it takes them to a website. Now, is that a website related to the influencer? Is it the company's website? Is it completely separate? What does that um, website look it like? It could be, yeah, I mean, Usually unrelated to the company is better. You want it okay. to, um, you know, it's a sponsored piece of content that lives on a publisher site is, is what you're trying to do. Got so it. companies like Vox, um, companies like uh, dig.com, companies like Refinery29, mm -hmm. they'll host your content as a sponsored piece of content. And, and you basically want to be on a credible source uh, or a site that is also known as a credible source for content or news or whatever it may be. Um, so that as a consumer, when you get there, you know, it's, it's legit. It's not just a, a scammy ad. Um, and I should also probably say you shouldn't be running scammy ads in general. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Definitely don't use my strategies with. Your scammy ads. <laughs> um, okay. So now people are on the website. Um, like say they're on refinery 29, um, at that point, you said that there's a difference between how, you know, this type of content is written compared to regular type of content. What are the main differences and how do you make it look like native content and not just like a, a, an ad? Um, I mean, one, staying true to the editorial style guide or the editorial voice is key. Um, two, it's just, it's just simply written. Like I always used to tell my team and I, I still tell my team that, um, you know, an, a, a, like an eight year old should be able to read this piece of content, understand it, and then tell it back to you. And, um, if, if an eight year old can tell it back to you, um, or if you, <laughs> the other thing we used to do sometimes is just, you just get some whiskey, you take a couple <laughs> sips of whiskey and if you can understand the content and teach it back out, then, then it's a good piece of content. Drug testing. Uh, yeah, exactly. And so, um, you know, that's, that's just what we did as, yeah. as we would, we would literally just test it like that. Um, or we would send it to different people and say, what do you think of this? Um, there's no, like, there's no math formula for psychology or for, uh, sociology or, or contextual understanding. So you just gotta, you know, send it out and see what people think and, and take the feedback you get and make those changes. Wicked. Now, how do you get from there to the landing page? So you've got the landing page. Um, what are the call to actions? How do you make sure that people do, don't just read and leave? How do you make sure there's a call to action and they actually get there? So at the end, you can have a call to action at the end of the piece of content. Um, sometimes you can get mentions of the brand linked out to the landing page okay. as well. Um, if you have a call to action at the end and mentions of the brand linked out, you can usually get about a 15% click through rate out to the landing page from the people that come to the article. 85% um, will end up browsing the site or just leave. Um, but then once you get to the landing page, you pretty much got them in the bag. Then there's, then there's about like a 60 to 70% conversion rate from some of the numbers I've seen lately. Got it. And if you have, for example, a call to action at the bottom of the article, is that going to be to buy the product? Is it going to be for an opt-in for something? What type of call to I mean, action? It depends. That? It depends, right? So like, um, I've always done it to buy the product. If you check out uh, Buffy Comforters websites, you see that they will sometimes opt in only for email and okay. then they might upsell you via email. 
Um, it usually depends on the order value of the product. The higher the order value, the more likely they're just trying to initiate contact or get you into their funnel. Um, if the order value is below, you know, $150, you can usually convert them right there. Got it. Awesome. So now, by the way, that's a pretty clear picture of how it works. Thanks for sharing. I'd love to know. Now, you have obviously seen a lot of brands do that. Um, what are the biggest mistakes? Maybe a handful. The biggest mistakes is usually in the copy or in the uh, creative as a whole. So okay. the image in the copy. Um, and then and then usually on the article itself. Um, there's a lot that goes into the UX. Um, and there's a lot that goes into the way that the content is written that most people just don't get right. Got it. Like what, for example, do you, is there like, um, it, it's, yeah, it's hard to nail a specific, but it's like, you know, things like, uh, ad copy can be too much or too little, or it's not, it's not properly formatted for, to fit desktop and mobile or, you know, maybe a headline runs and there's one word on the second line of the headline, which you don't want because now that's messy and you take out the opportunity for that newsfeed description text to be in there. Uh, maybe your ad copy has an emoji at the end, but the emojis on the second line or, or just doesn't, it looks weird. Right. Uh, you know, there's all these things. It's really just visually, uh, how, how visually aesthetic is the creative and then the same type of mindset applies to the actual piece of content where is it easy to read? Is it intimidating when you get to the site? Is it, uh, you know, is it easy to flow through? Mm. So. Awesome. So let's say, um, you know, there's a brand listening to this and they want to employ that strategy, you know, uh -huh. before one date becomes a strategy of the past. Um, what would you, what would be your biggest um, advice to that company if they wanted to execute on that strategy? So go through every tweet mention of your brand, go through every review and maybe even call up customers or go talk to customers and see what they really like about the brand or what draws them, them to the brand and, and then build some kind of authentic story around that. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to fake a story, but consumers can also smell that from a mile away. And, um, and authentic stories tend to just do the best. I mean, they don't, th those are the only ones that work. So when you're saying authentic stories, um, what type of story are we talking about? Because obviously here we're talking about selling a product. Obviously we don't want to be, uh, we don't want to write a sales speech. It's really an article on, uh, on an authoritative website. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some examples of stories? Yeah, I mean, at Hint, we used to do our founder story a ton. Um, founder stories tend to do really well because, uh, you know, it's a very authentic way of telling how the company came about and, and why it's a functional product and what problem it solves. Um, in addition to that, you might have, uh, you know, you might have a product that helps people in ways that it didn't help you, but it helps them. And, you know, there could be a whole cohort of consumers that it helps them in the same way that it might help that consumer. So if it's, you know, for Hint, you know, we, we saw that there were uh, patients who were going through chemotherapy who, because of the medication they're on, they get a metallic taste in their, their tongue. And Hint helps to mask that taste when they drink water. So when they drink water, it doesn't taste like metal, it tastes like fruit. And so, um, you know, there's, there's so many different ways you can just take a good product and, and tell stories about it. But if the product isn't good and if, if there's no real story behind the brand, then it's, it's hard to implement the strategy like this. This just won't work for any of the drop shipping Alibaba garbage. Stores. You need to have a brand, you know, at the end of the yeah. day, you need to stand for something and not just a logo that you slap overnight. Like it really has to be something with a story. Um, that's right. awesome. So Nick, just to like kind of recap for everyone listening. So, you know, this whole strategy is all about, um, you know, one, really understanding, defining what a story behind your brand that you can use to get people to learn about it and identify with your brand, right? So then you're using influencers or third-party sources to, to kind of promote that through Facebook ads and sponsored content, which then sends it, which sends the traffic to a website, an authoritative website, like it could be Forbes, right, or Refinery29, um, where there's an article that tells that brand story that customers can relate to.
Now in that article, which is not a sales page, um, there's gonna be a link to the brand's website and maybe even a call to action at the bottom, depending on the average order value for that product. You know, it, it might be a straight up sales page or it could be an email sign up. If you said around a, over $150, it's best to have an email sign up to really get people into the funnel. Um, and this whole strategy not only increases conversions, um, lower cost of acquisition in your experience, but also increases lifetime value because people got introduced to the brand not just by being sold to, but by being, I guess, indoctrinated into the brand um, so they can relate. Yeah. Sweet. Anything else that you want to add? Um, test a ton of creative because... If your ads aren't working, it's probably because your creative sucks. Sweet. Yeah, there are so many people just, you know, hey, you were testing this once, and at the end of the day, they say it doesn't work. Sometimes it's just because they haven't tested enough. So yeah. Always be testing. Um, oh. Nick, awesome. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing all these golden insights. So now if people want to keep in touch with you and, and just keep learning from you and see what you're up to, where should they go? Best place is Twitter, at Mr. Sharma on Twitter. Um, I try to respond to every DM, and um, yeah, that's the best place to find me. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you. All right, that's it for today's episode. And in the next episode, you'll hear from Gareth Everard, co-founder of Rockwell Razors, Keto, and a few other e-commerce brands. You'll learn how he calculates and utilizes lifetime value of his customers to make paid ads ultra profitable and a key driver of profit for his businesses. To make sure you don't miss any of the new episodes, subscribe to the podcast. And if you've liked what you've heard, make sure to leave a review in the iTunes store. That would truly mean the world to me. Now, if you're working on an e-commerce store that does over a million dollars in online sales and increasing conversions is currently a priority, make sure to go to splitbase.com slash assessment. That's splitbase.com slash assessment to get a free analysis of your website and find out what's the number one action item our conversion experts recommend that you do next to boost your conversions. If you have any guest requests, questions, or comments, um, tweet me at rpaulindagle, that's R-P-A-U-L-I-N-D-A-I-G-L-E, and I'll be super happy to hear from you. Thanks again for listening. This is Minds of E-Commerce.